Hello, I'm Brian Sethurst in Los Angeles. And I'm Alison Norrington in London, and welcome to the Story Hour. Our show, The Story Hour, sits at the intersection of storytelling and technology. We bring you the story behind the stories, how it's written, how it's produced, how it's distributed, and the personal stories behind the storytellers themselves. We talk with the master writers, producers, directors, authors and technologists covering it all, from film and television to literature, virtual and augmented reality, and more, as well as the innovations in production, technology and distribution that are changing the how of storytelling. Our guest today is a director, creator and producer of groundbreaking TV and arena scale live shows who relishes in telling immersive, engaging stories that bring the audience alongside the drama to give maximum impact. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, writer, producer, actor, director, and failed art student, Will Brenton. <laughs> that is the best intro I've ever had, thank you. Yeah, we had, we had a few chuckles about it while we were running it down, so. <laughs> I'm so proud of failed art student. Well, it's the things that go wrong that make us, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Every time. I put a lot of work into that. Well, and I'm <laughs> sure that all the other students that with you that were in school with you and the teachers who we've never heard of and never heard from again, um, you know, they've probably heard of you by now. So, yeah, yes, you never know. Yes. By he still can't draw a house. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'll tell you the story one day, maybe later. Who knows? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Allison because the two of you actually know each other from the children's television business, yes? Yes, Ooh. we do. And you know, I don't really know the first time we met. I think we were doing a session together at Children's Media Conference. I think it was, yeah. It yeah. was, right. Was it the thing about the uh, building a story Bible, building a pitch Bible? Bible? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yes. I think I said something clever that day and then I had to lie down for a couple of days. <laughs> well, I don't actually remember it like that, I have to say. <laughs> but one of the things I love about what you do so well, and I know we have spoken about this before, is the way you do put the audiences at the front. And it's something that I feel as a writer often gets overlooked because you have this vision or this dream of telling the story that you want to tell. And then somehow along the road, you get caught up in a pipeline of process whether that's with a publisher or a network or whatever. And the focus kind of slowly shifts away from the audience because there's other things to consider. But I love how you've held on to that. I think if you lose sight of the audience, you lose sight of the point of literally everything you're doing. It's, I mean, I, without being melodramatic about it, far be it from me to be melodramatic, but that is why you're doing everything you're doing as a creator. I don't mean to wobble the camera, sorry. Um, so, for instance, your your brands now become more and more important, don't they? I mean, you've got brand identity, you've got channel identity, you've got publisher identity. And what happens in any discussion about a new project is that that kind of identity gets put into the equation. As soon as the balance shifts to the point where you're talking more about the brand than you are about the audience, for me, I think you've lost the plot, really. You've, you've, you've lost what you're doing. Uh, I, I want to step back for a moment, Alison, if you don't mind, because Will's background is so rich and I am absolutely certain that every experience builds upon the next. So I art school notwithstanding, we'll save that for 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 a logger later. Um, but going into acting, starting out as an actor and then moving into directing because you've directed Emmerdale and Coronation Street, and then moving into live arena-based events. And, and you, you know, you talked about brand, but what I think you're really nailing is a, a story world, being able to translate the story world that the audience can participate in, in each and every case. But I, I wanted to go back and just ask a little bit, Allison, if you don't mind, I just want to go back and ask a little bit about acting and how that started and when you decided you were going to move from acting into directing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so one of the reasons I was a failed art student was because I was skiving off art college to go and do performing in a local youth theatre. And so that, be for me growing up in Liverpool in what was the mid 70s then, <clears throat> the idea of going into acting was such an alien profession. It was something that was a million miles away. It was something that other people did. And we did it for fun. I was a member of a youth theatre. I did stuff at school. 
Um, and, but the idea of doing that professionally was so alien to me that when the, the, the person who ran my youth theatre, a lady called Wendy Weldon, who was just a god in many ways, said, you should do this, you should go for it. It just seemed out of this world. So, you know, I threw everything I could at it and my family brilliantly supported me to do it. And I went into acting and I kind of made a reasonable fist at it and I was, I was working well. But I just found that I was drawn more and more to the content of the story and what we were doing and what we were doing for the audience and how we were communicating. And when you're an actor, as much as you would like to be, you're not the engineer behind the content of the story. And that's where I wanted to be. So that's, it, again, somebody said to me, have you ever thought of directing? Um, and I thought it's just because they wanted to stop me acting, to be honest. Um, but they they helped train me up into directing. And also I started writing episodes. I was presenting a kids' TV show called Play Days, and they, they took me across from presenting it to writing it and directing it. And then the rest was history from that point on. Because uh, I was just able to, I was able to be at the coal face of the whole thing and say, right, I can, I can influence this story. I can create this story. I can, I can get that message across. And, and that's just what turned me on. So that's what I wanted but to I do. I've got to say like, Brian, you've got a history on the stage as well. Right. Oh, you kept that quiet. Yeah, yeah he does. I, yeah. Don't get him started, but it's pretty I do. good. I, I, I was, re I was having a nasty little flashback <laughs> um, because I studied with an acting teacher named Michael Howard, who is really quite an am amazing teacher. Um, but at the time, I was more interested in writing songs. And so I used to sit at the back of acting class while everyone else was doing their scenes, writing music and writing songs. And uh, one day I got caught and he said, if that's what you want to do, then don't do it in class, leave class. Uh, but when you're here, you know, and then um, just to you know, you make different transitions in life. For me, the um, the break was when a casting director would cast me in a film after the film said, I'd like to take you to dinner. And I thought, oh, this is great <laughs> for my career. And she said, and she was English. And she said, darling, you might be a good actor, but you'll never be a great actor. And I looked at her and I said, why not? And she said, darling, you don't want it badly enough. You're not committed and you're OK, but you're not going to be great. And I quit. I mean, it was, wow. it was the best thing someone did for me. But no one said, hey, have you thought of directing? And um, <laughs> my, my curiosity, Will, here is that, you know, when you were acting, obviously you were present when you were saying your lines, but what, were, were you, when you were off, off screen, were you observing everything else that was going on? And did you know that's what you were doing? Or No, I didn't know that's what I was doing. I, I, I think it was because... Uh, the way I would approach what I was doing as an actor. In, in other words, I was, you can, there's two directions, isn't there, where you look at a piece, you either look at a piece from what you're doing outwards, or you look at the overall piece inwards. And my view was always looking at the overall piece inwards. And I think that's what made people think, oh, maybe actually he's looking at the overall here. And that I think might be what made them think that I matched the idea of directing. So someone actually recognized that in you and then said, how about this? Yes, yeah, they did. Great. She's a producer called Claire Bradley, and she's a brilliant producer. Uh, and I, I owe pretty much all of it to her to to actually, again, putting the idea in my mind that that was something that I could do. But well, how then? So you said like you were looking at all of it kind of inwardly to see the bigger picture, but then there's something too about being on the stage and looking in the eye of the audience. How did that factor in, or do you think it did? Oh, it hugely did. So there was quite a crossover period. So I was I was an actor and a director over a period of about 10 years. And uh, myself and Vivian Lachlan, who was my part, we co-created the Tweenies. Um, he and I got together both as presenters uh, on play days. He goes back as far as play school. He was a play school presenter. And then we started writing the pantomimes for the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. And he would play the dame and I would play the idiot son. And we became a kind of double act. And doing that side of the work that we did where, you know, on a, in a panto with a double act at the center of it like that, 40% of the show is the two of you on stage together. Right. And it's all about your relationship with the audience. It's all about everything you do is 
bringing the audience alongside you and saying, we can have a laugh about this, we can do this, we can do that, we can do that. That, I think, is the most formative part of my performing career, where everything you write, you're imagining exactly how the audience is going to react to it, what reaction you want them to have, which gags are going to be a slow burn that you can just let them hang there and they'll get them, which gags are meant to be a shock. You know, everything is about you being a barometer for how the audience are going to react to something. And that's why I believe comics make great dramatic actors is because they are thinking about the effect on the audience the whole time. And I think, I mean, I might be going out on a limb here, but I think one or two actors might be slightly guilty of being slightly self-indulgent about their performances and feeling it sits with them on the stage. And of course it doesn't. You can be thinking about your shopping list, but if the audience think you're grieving, job done. Yep. Everything is about the audience. Yep. So I think directing and performing at the same time, again, and working in TV directing whilst doing live theatre as an actor, you have a quite a holistic um, field of experience then mm-hmm. which you're you're instinctively drawing upon you're you're instinctively writing gags into things or writing emotional moments into things because you've seen how that plays out when you're when you're in front of an audience and that's gold dust isn't it like people yeah. pay a lot of money for that kind of analytics to understand like for that but <laughs> <laughs> no but I mean not people like you perhaps but you know there's agencies that do that mm. you know the psychology and the emotion behind how audiences react And the idea of like fragmenting audiences by personality type and behaviours. And, you know, there was um, a book written a few years ago called, I think, Little Bets by a guy called Peter Sims. Mm. And in there he talks, I think it's about Chris Rock, who would have one of his big sellout tours. But he'd spend months beforehand, like going around to small towns and villages and for like $30 doing a show. And Mm. he'd have his people there like literally reporting back on which were the gags that worked which was the ones that didn't so by the time he's doing vegas or wherever he was doing you know every single line delivers on point because it's been tested so much and that's yeah, something that's you can't easily do. yeah it's a hard thing for tv isn't it because everyone yes. has to second guess that exactly and so what you're doing the whole time is you're saying, well, our research tells us that our kids were like this. Our research tells us our audience were like this. Yep. But there's nobody standing there who says, I know they're like this because I've, I've asked them it. I've, I've right. done, I've performed it in front of them. Right. I've come across scenarios where I've been told by producers that certain things won't work, even though we've just been literally on stage in front of a thousand people proving it does work, you know, uh, and you're right, it is gold dust and it's at the front of everything we do, almost, again, almost instinctively, because when whenever I write something, I am, I'm imagining the audience's reaction to it. How do you handle that conversation then? Like you're in that scenario and you've proven that something has the desired reaction. You're talking to a product, producer or a production company and they're telling you it won't work. How does that conversation go? Well, it depends on that producer. Right. But it will be a very, it'll actually be a very simple story. I'll give you an example. I won't mention any of the names involved, but there was an episode of a show I was doing where I'd, I, I was, I'd written into a script I'd written for it, uh, um, a scenario where we had two characters and they were singing to and contouring a little star. And I wanted them to whisper it. And the, the producer said, well, they can't do that because the kids at home will switch off. They, they won't listen to it anymore. And I said, no, that's not actually what happens. When you whisper something um, on stage, children stand up and they want to come towards you. They're nosy. They want to find out what's going on. You know, I always say this about preschool kids when they watch TV. They don't sit back to watch TV. They stand up and walk towards it. It's not a passive experience. Um, And the same goes in a live scenario. Uh, And they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't. Their confidence in doing something that felt sat back was so weak because they didn't have the experience of seeing it happen. Yeah. Um, and that meant that it, that was a battle I lost because there was no convincing them to, to say, okay, I appreciate the fact that you might have experienced that and therefore go with, go with it. And in that, on that occasion, the, the argument that came back at me was, yes, but, you know, theatre is different to TV. And I said, yeah, but the, the kids aren't. You know, they're <laughs> yeah. experiencing it in a different way. I um, think that awareness of people's response because you know now 
Well, actually, it's very, very challenging. You see all these people doing concerts and shows and things from at home. Um, over here, we have an example, the Saturday Night Live. That show mm -hmm. thrived on a live audience. And so when they went for the first at home version and they didn't have the audience to feed back off of it, it was deadly. And then the next week you noticed that it was what they were now going to do was bring themselves in as the audience so that they were all on watching one another's thing. Last night I watched um, a concert that was a fundraiser, a night in Austin. Um, very, very challenging in where we are now um, because there is no audience. But I would think that your knowledge of what audiences are reacting to, all of your experience, might come to bear. And uh, you have done it all. I mean, you've done live arena shows and held, the, held to the integrity of the characters in the story world. And, and I would say held to the integrity of the audience, which is really important. So I'm just going to ask you, I don't know how long this will continue. There are millions of, it seems, people working on solutions for how this can be better. But I don't think that anybody has gotten it to the level of quality of performance and production value that people would actually be willing to pay for, let alone watch on a regular basis. So how would you respond to this challenge where you're in the story world, but you're not necessarily having the feedback of the audience? It's really difficult, isn't it? I mean, I, on one hand, I would say that I'm used to TV being exactly that anyway, because TV, a lot of the TV that you make for younger kids, you don't have an audience in the room. We did have a show that ITV took many years ago that where we, we trialed it with the live audience and the live audience was taken out. And then, of course, very quickly, they realized that we need the live audience in there, don't we? For all the same reasons that you're, you're citing there with Saturday Night Live. I think if this was to go on for a long, long time, we would find a way in the same way that we, when TV first came out, we were just filming theatre. We, we hadn't worked out what TV is. The trick is not to try and do what we have been doing in a way that's gonna work, in a way that it's not going to work. What we have to do is to find a way of doing something new and different that will work in the, in the, in the method we've got. I would think this would be, uh, yeah, I don't know that anyone's asked you yet, but I would think this would be a challenge that you, given your background, would, would rise to very quickly. I would love to. It's interesting. I was having a conversation the other day um, with a company I've been working with on various live things. And interestingly, going forward, the, the medium that's working best for them in terms of how do we visualize how this world exists now is the immersive walkthrough experience. The thing that's kind of been slightly on the, on the fringes of things where you do a walkthrough the, the fact that people are being controlled in smaller groups and they they go through t in a timed way and they're kept apart from each other to allow the performances to happen episodically, you know, so you get something that will be on a four minute loop and, and you get one group in, it plays, there's a minute to bring in the next group and that sort of thing they're looking at now saying we can do this under the current restrictions. So that slightly fringe way of creating a, an experience for an audience has now suddenly come into the middle. So are you speaking of, about a live theater experience where people come in kind of like Sleep No More was in New York where you're going through this mansion and you're following characters? Are you talking about, say, a filmed dome experience where people are immersed in the story that way and then they move on? Are, are you, I'm trying to visualize this. Are you talking about um, kind of like what The Void does over here which is, you know, everybody's in headsets and they're walking through this environment um, that is all projected onto the real world that they're in. I'm just trying to figure out exactly where you're landing. They wait, the way they tend to work is they're, they're, they're a walkthrough experience. So you, there's a route around. So imagine Ikea, but with actors, where you're walking through it and you come, so you might be doing, for the sake of argument, you might be doing the time machine by H.G. Wells. And you come in and you meet the characters and they do a monologue and then they go in the machine and you go through to the next thing, which might be a projected experience of the time tunnel. And then you go through to the next environment, which might be 
the time zone that they land in. And so what you're doing is you're, as an audience, you're in small groups and you're walking through to short staged scenes effectively. And when you move out of the first one you've watched into the second one, another group is moving in behind you. And so the whole audience is kind of moving through like this. The, the actors and the experience is on a loop so that that just plays to everybody. And you move, instead of having one performance for 500 people lasting two hours, it takes eight hours and you move your 500 people through in the day. Now that has always been quite fringe. It's a little bit like secret cinema as well. But now it's the type of performance that people are saying, this is what we can do. And that's well, it's like what they're doing in the theme parks, right? It's like a static yeah. um, installation, if you like, in a theme yeah. park where they you know, pull people in and you go into the haunted house and there's like 20 of you that are taken into a room and, you know, you know, like five minutes behind you, there's another 20 that are coming yeah. down again, right? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, are you talking about taking that into like a virtual space now because of where we are with COVID? I think you could do. I think you can. you could still stage that in a way where you, you would have to work it so that your groups are family groups or household groups or you know, the groups that whatever the lockdown scenario allows, mm -hmm. you'd have to stage it. So any actors were never within that two meter range, but that's pretty much the way it works anyway. Mm -hmm. You do get immersive stuff where the actors are in amongst the crowd. That obviously couldn't happen, but that's a, that's a first step in the water. You need to go into a space. The good thing about arena spaces, of course, is that you've got a lot of space to stage stuff, but what you couldn't do is, is, again create the kind of en masse audience experience it would be a much different thing well um, as you might guess have... on the american side here i i'm married from the television business to 22 minute segments <laughs> and so we know what that means yeah so we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back and uh explore more about what the future of storytelling is as as it will be defined by you and we'll be right back 